I'm just going to be honest with them. So look, this is what the plan is. The end goal is that um, we're going to flip this property after it's been refurbed and we're going to sell it. And I'm looking for a profit of X. Mm. Like, uh, that's my goal. Yes. The, a fair bit of, of abuse online, which is fine. Because uh, it, it, it took a while for me to get my head around it. You know, why, why are people reacting yeah like yeah. you know the people that don't know me they're, they're, they're having a pop at me for all kinds of different things and and you know essentially just trying to put me down but i just stayed focused i thought you know there's someone behind that screen that might be watching this video today that needs to hear what i've got to say because they're at the end where potentially today might be the day that they yeah end their life and and so that i just thought that supersedes any negativity George, each and every day about 55 businesses go bust and about 25% of them are tradespeople, plumbers, electricians, builders. So that means the chances are whoever I hire to do some work for me on a property, there's a good chance it might go bust. Unfortunately, yeah. What is it do you think that we can do to try and protect ourselves as property investors, people hiring in these kind of services? Yeah, great question. I think um, do your due diligence. Um, go with people that are recommended uh, as a starting point. Look at things like Google reviews or wherever else uh, the trades and construction business owners have their reviews. Um, and then just just see the way that they approach the conversations, the way they approach quotation visits um, and how structured and organized they are um, and focused on on customer service and in getting you the result uh, as the client, getting you the result that you want. And so that would be a great starting point. Mm -hmm. um, you can, if you want, go delve deeper and you know do some research into their finances and their business. But ultimately, how do they show up um, because the way that they communicate online and offline will give you an indication of what they're going to be like on site. The quality of their communication, yeah. how responsive they are. Okay, so I guess that's a great sign when we're talking to somebody, if they're at least getting back to us. I guess one of the challenges we have in our space, especially when the market is very active and buoyant and the trades guys are, are busy, we get three people around to do a quote. Uh, it's not what some I recommend because maybe only one of them will show up. Or two will show up and one doesn't bother doing a quote. So often we have to get five or six people in to try and uh, ask for a quote. Maybe three of those might show up and you might end up with one quote. Yeah. yeah Would you say that. that's a representative or do you think that's probably unfair on being a little bit there? Uh, actually, it's not unfair. It's a representation of the industry. Um, we work with uh, trades and construction business owners and have done over the last 17 years. For many years, many of those 17 years, I used to think that, you know, it's um, it's really unfortunate that there's some negative stigma around trades and construction business owners that they're not going to turn up. And if they do, they're going to be late. And if they take a deposit, they're going to disappear. Or they finish a job, get paid the balance. If there's any snag or any issues, you know, with, with the, the work, that they're not going to call back and they're not going to make good, you know, on, on their promise. And so for many years, I thought this is a, a really unfair negativity around the industry. The last five years that I've actually looked at this and analyzed that, I actually think it's a good thing. Um, so here's what I mean by that is um, all of our clients stand out for the right reasons because they do the opposite of what people expect okay. the tradesmen to do. Yeah, They're, res they're responsive. Um, they, they do what they say they're going to do. They turn up on time. They always look smart. Um, logo uniform, uh, sign written vehicle, uh, shoe covers, dust sheets for the work, polite. You know, they look to build rapport. Um, they look to add value when they're walking around a property, um, not just, oh yeah, you know, what, what do you need quoting? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the problem? Um, they actually go a step further and look at look around the property, make some suggestions about how people can improve or save money or or fix things without it costing too much. And so it's just that whole that whole energy that I think uh, I'm actually glad on some level that there is this negative stigma around trade and construction business owners because all the guys that we work with stand out like a sore thumb in a positive way because they do all the things that you want. They instill confidence and trust. Yeah, if I think about, there's probably three teams of builders I've worked with over the last probably 12, 13 years. One of them has literally just never worked for anybody else during that time. So once we'd kind of both realized we're quite happy the way we worked together, that was it. It was like a marriage. Nice. We kind of stuck together. But the challenge is when we look for new people, we, we, we do find it difficult. But also sometimes when I'm speaking to people I'm helping and supporting uh, and mentoring as well and we're looking for tradespeople or builders to come out to look at jobs I think it's also important for us as the client to be clear what we're looking for so for example it's, yeah we want an extension here and a, a kitchen there can you give us a call please mate so if we if we provide that little detail we can't expect the the builder to to produce magic from yeah. that and it 
we're not going to be able to compare uh, apples with apples. We're going to be apples and oranges because it's going to be a different perspective each yep. person has. Yeah, absolutely agree. So how can we get more clear as a client in terms of what we want, say, from a from a builder? Yeah. Um, I think if we just, for a second, just pause and zoom out, I think it's, it's great for all of us to be reminded of this and, and not just when we're looking to get a build project done, but just in life and in business and with relationships that we have with or just be clear on what you want, what you don't want, what you like, what you don't like. Um, it just makes life and business a lot easier. So that's, that's the first thing. When it comes to um, build projects, again, just being clearer on on what it is you want. So um, I'll give you the perspective that we give our clients as trades and construction business owners to help them grow. And then the flip side works for us as as consumers and clients to the trades industry. And so I always say to our guys, look, be, be um, extremely clear on what you're best at, you know, that your customer focus. So for example, asking what's your priority or your, your top three priorities, or at least your top number one priority with this particular project. Because oftentimes I'm in forums with lots of trades and a lot of these guys are complaining that, you know, or, you know, this customer is a tire kicker, they're wasting time, or this person, you know, is just fishing for different prices. And, you know, so there's, there's a lot of negativity from the trades industry towards the consumers. Um, in the country and so um, I, I tell my guys like be clear uh, and, and, and find out what's most important to them what they want are you looking to add value to the property or are you just trying to build your dream home or you know you, you might come across a landlord that's got multiple properties and the priority for that particular landlord is just to get everything in be compliant have all these certificates do it so you can get a tenant in the ASAP yeah. so it can earn you money yeah. you might speak to a different landlord that has got a high-end property and therefore wants it done at a higher spec so then they can command more rent in the market. It, so it's important for you to ask these questions rather yeah. than just coming in and giving a bog-standard quote with a bog-standard process. So find out exactly what people want and then then you can establish whether you're the right plumber, builder, electrician, etc. to do the job. Um, but now all of a sudden the, the, the consumer, the customer thinks, you know, this person is asking questions over and above what I would expect because they're trying to find out Okay, so we can come in and do the, the project as you want. So yeah, we can give you a quote for an extension or a kitchen, etc. But what's the end goal? You know, is it to increase value of the property in the future? Is it to just get some money in because you've got tenants in? You know, there might be some people that, that are in a rush because their mother-in-law is going to come and stay and they want to build a, an annex or whatever, you know, whatever the situation is, but find out about other people. Um, because I, I, I'm a big believer and a big fan of People only really care about the result they're going to get, which is the actual physical thing that you can see. Mm. But also, that's 50%. The other 50% is the experience. Yeah. And so you could get a, a bad tradesman that isn't the best at his or her craft, but the experience is great and there's a good chance that they'll be used again, even though maybe the problem wasn't solved the first time or you know it's not exactly the finish they wanted, but the, the experience was great. Yeah. Versus someone who is absolutely shit hot at their craft unbelievable like precision looks amazing everything's brilliant but the experience was terrible and that's what people remember so when it comes to you know your your friend or your brother or sister or your next door neighbor asking would you recommend that trades person for me they're going to say no um you know knowing what i know about the trades and construction industry we had almost a full refurb six and a half years ago my wife and i before we moved into the house that we live in now and um to this day, I, I'm so happy with the house. Unbelievable. If you ask me now, would I recommend that builder? Absolutely, 100% categorically no. Okay. Because dealing with him was a nightmare. Yes. Um, he was rude. He made my, my wife, who was pregnant at the time, cry twice. Um, you know, which took a lot for me not to, you know, she was feisty enough to deal with it. Um, but, you know, would I recommend? Absolutely no. Because that's not, that's not the kind of experience that I want. Yes. And we weren't even living in the property while it was getting refurbed, wow. you know. So imagine if we did, it would have been yeah. not 10 times worse. So, you know, I, I sit here and say, you know, the, the quality of the work was brilliant. Um, but would I recommend him? No. Yeah, uh, you mentioned something that I believe is absolutely key. What's most important for you? Because that can create a completely different outcome in terms of what people want. But we very often don't ask that question to in order to navigate which way we're going. So yeah. uh, even uh, as on the customer side, when we want something done, well, is it, well, we just want a quick repair done because we just want this thing done, or is it actually we want an all singing, dancing system, or is it something in between? But unless we we are able to 
explain that that's important for us, how can we expect the uh, the, the trades or the contractor to know what we what we really want? Yeah, exactly. And so so from a trades point of view, I tell the guys like ask those questions, find out what's most important to them, find out what their end goal is, short term and long term with this property and this project, this refurb, whatever the case may be. Um, and then I'll use the exact same advice in the opposite sense, which is as a potential client of a trades uh, person, you know what what's you know asking asking the same question to them, telling them obviously what you want. Um, I also have a, a conversation fairly frequently with trades business owners around, you know, how do we navigate around um, extras on a job? So um, as a little side note, 0% of projects, build projects, refurbs, whatever you want to uh, categorize it as, 0% go exactly to plan. There's always some extension or uh, like a, a, of time it takes a bit longer or there's some add-ons or there's issues or you you know you you, you know you, you draw in that behind that wall and yeah. you find something that you didn't know was there so all of that kind of stuff happens anyway there's a lot of unforeseen in this section yeah. and i always say look when you're costing a project it's always going to take longer and it's going to cost more yeah exactly. whatever you think it's going to take longer exactly more. so you know a lot of our guys say oh you know like i feel uncomfortable you know we've quoted we've been accepted uh for the quote they've paid the deposit we're going to start you know next week etc or we started the job and, and then the, the client says oh like as you're here can you do this or as you're here can you do that and these extras, and, and oftentimes, these guys don't feel comfortable to say, yeah, no problem, we can do that. We're going to have to add it to the quote. So, you know, it's my job to help them navigate that conversation. The flip side to that is, you know, at the same time, as a, as a client of a tradesperson, don't expect all these extras to happen without um, it affecting the, the time scale of the project, without it affecting the, the cost of the project. You know, if we go to a restaurant and we order a, a three-course meal, and uh, let's just say we really enjoyed our starters and we're like, actually, you know what? We're really hungry. When the mains come, bring another couple of the same starters. We're going to be expected to pay for that. Even though we, it's an extra because we ordered it after, you know, the, the main part of the ordering. You know, so it, it's, I find it interesting that on some level, psychologically, somehow we've ended up in a place where people think, oh, it's tradespeople, so we can ask them to reduce their prices or just do these extras. So I feel like just, just having that understanding. Yes. It's almost taking advantage of them really in that situation yeah. or not valuing what they're doing. Yeah. You say, when you're here anyway, can you like, you know, just do this bit and that bit? It won't take long. Well, how do you know it won't take long? And how do you know how decent of a job you want done? And, yeah. you know, there's some value to the person asking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I appreciate that. And that's why I think um, if we just put the trades guys to one side for a second, just think about, you know, us who aren't trades um, and we get involved in property and, and there's some work that happens in various properties over the years. Just be clear on what you want. And then just communicate that effectively, you know, just saying, look, this is my priority. You know, yes, we don't want like dirt cheap, extra, you know, a crap job to be done. But the context of this property is that I literally just need the basics done so that we're compliant. We've got all the certificates, we've got whatever we need so we can get tenants in their ASAP and start earning money on the, on, the, um, on the property. Or it could be something else. But the point is, is just knowing what you want and communicating that, that well enough. Yeah. Um, and also just not, not being not being um, afraid of certain questions like, you know, if you're asked what your budget is and, and automatically you think, well, I don't really want to tell them the budget because they're just going to use it up even though it might be less. Um, just, just being confident and comfortable with those conversations, being clear on what you want, being clear with, with the guys that you're going to bring in. If they can help you, great. If they can't, no problem. Move on to the next one. What's your thoughts on how uh, us as a customer should be approaching the number of quotes that we look for, you know, People talk about, oh, you need to get three quotes and just go for the one in the middle. Yeah. Um, what What's your view on how we should be asking for quotes and how we should be comparing? Yeah, again, I just think um, nice, clear, open communication. Um, you've also got to factor in, um, yes, there is this this um, this thought process in society of, oh, you know, you got to get three quotes and go for the one in the middle, like you just said. But at the same time, like, you know, I, I'm born and raised in London. We're obviously here doing this in, in Birmingham, you know, two busy cities, the two biggest cities in the country. So I'm coming from the angle of I'm used to busy lives. I also don't want to have to rearrange my diary and be home for six quotes. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, ultimately I want to get to a place in life where like we have our accountant or our um, solicitor or our mechanic, you've got your electrician, you've got your builder, you've got your plumber. So you want to build relationships. Mm -hmm. And so go into it with that in mind, not just a quick fix and, you know, we don't really care about relationships and whatever. Um, so just be clear on, on what you want um, and, and also the, the time involved, you know, in all of that and, and just manage people's expectations. Yes. You know, just say, look, I'm going to get a few quotes. 
Um, we've got some stuff from the trades point of view that you know we we uh, we teach them to navigate through that, so people don't feel like they need to get two, yeah. three, or four, five, or six quotes. They can just get one from you know one of our clients, and uh, and the best way to get there, and and just um, just be clear on what you got. Because I mean, I might as well just tell you now. You know, we tell our, our guys like find out um, how many other quotes have you had. If they don't, have, if they haven't had any other quotes, you know, we we train our guys to say, um, well, thanks for giving us the opportunity to be the first person you get a quote from. What would you need to get from our quote that will make you feel like actually I don't need to get any other quotes? That's a great question. Yeah. Or um, the flip side to that, if someone says, "Oh, we've had two quotes already. You're the third. Brilliant. Thanks for the opportunity. Out of curiosity, because I value your time, what didn't you get from those two quotes that led you to calling us? Because surely, on some level, if you got everything that you wanted from those two or one of those two quotes, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So, I value your time. I want to. I want to add as much value to you as possible. What didn't you get? Because we may or may not be the right company for you, yeah. and that just sets a, a nice yeah. sets the scene nicely for an open, honest communication. And then at that point, they can decide whether they're the right trades yeah. construction company to to move forward. But also, it's just that all that that line of questioning is all about the client. Yeah, you know, to find out you know what it is. But like for me, I'm a big fan of asking questions like this. You know, what's the ideal outcome for for anything? You know, even if I'm taking my wife on a date night. What's your ideal outcome for this night? Like, what do you want to come? How do you want to come home feeling? Or we we had a family holiday uh, at the end of May, and um, I just said to my wife, you know, I, I want this to be an amazing family holiday. Um, as I mentioned to you, my my wife's uh, halfway through um, her third pregnancy, um, so we're gonna have a, an, an addition to the family in October, and I, and so this holiday was very much about this is our last family holiday as a four. Yes. Uh, before the, the you know the third baby comes yeah and so I said to her like what's your ideal outcome like how do you want to feel like let's build the holiday around that you know you want to feel less stressed brilliant let's book some massages for you um, you want you want some quality time with the kids cool we know what they like and what they don't like and whatever. let's let's build our days around that um, the, the kids love going to kids club like one or two days out of the out of the week so then you can get some alone time and all that kind of, so we're just just being intentional yeah. with that Thinking about the outcome. And yeah. we were off camera, we were talking about sort of outcomes. And yeah. most people don't think about, let's start with the end in mind. Yeah. Let's start where we're trying to get to and work backwards rather yeah. than starting with, well, let's just set up and we'll see what happens. Mm. Exactly. So, you know, if I'm someone that's planning a, a, a refurb, for example, and I'm thinking about what's the process I'm going to follow to find the right trades people to do what I need them to do, I'm just going to be honest with them. So look, this is what the plan is. The end goal is that um, we're going to flip this property after it's been refurbed and we're going to sell it and I'm looking for a profit of X. Mm. Like, uh, that's my goal. Yes. You know, so then now we can navigate through that in terms of the types of materials, the quality of materials, you know, the the warranties involved, all the, all the things that may or may not be a selling point when we put the, the property up for market or what's going to be attractive to a tenant that's going to come in. You know, so, um, yeah, just... Just clear communication. So you're you're not a builder, no. How did you fall into this world? What what's your background? How did you end up being where you are now? Yeah, great question. And doing what you do. So and just for clarification, elaborate a little bit more about what you do. Yeah. So um, the starting point was I accidentally fell into the insolvency industry. Um, for anyone uh, that's watching that doesn't know uh, what the insolvency industry is, essentially it's the industry that deals with liquidations, bankruptcies, administrations. People that have got to a point in life or business that have got a certain amount of debt and, and need it to be dealt with. And so I fell into that industry. Uh, it was only going to be short term for six months just to get some office experience and I was going to move on. And within those six months, um, two key things happened. The first one was I, I started to learn about lots of different businesses and why these businesses essentially failed um, and went into liquidation or administration. What I also uh, experienced was someone committing suicide because of money problems in their business. And that changed everything for me uh, at that point in terms of the way I just saw life. And so once that happened uh, in July 2006, um, I just went all in on the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, in my mind, um, I was I was fascinated by the interest in the industry to see why businesses failed and the repercussions because there's a family behind every business. Yeah, is the way I saw it, and um, and I thought you know I'm learning some stuff in this industry, and I feel like it's my duty to essentially make sure that nobody commits suicide on my watch because of money problems in their business. Mm -hmm. And so I went all in on the on the industry, and um, and, and that was great for the next few years. 
as in we were helping more and more people on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And it was very, very fulfilling. The frustrating part that grew and grew and grew was that um, I just felt that by the time people came to me for advice, it was the 11th hour. There's minimal options involved. Like, the, you know, the, there's a bailiff knocking at the door and someone's got my number. These from, are all kinds of businesses? That... Yeah, all kinds of businesses. And so um, that became quite frustrating that there's only one or two options, yeah. possibly three, because people are like, I've got to be a call tomorrow morning or there's a bailiff outside. What do I do? My kids are in the house. Um, you know, things like that. And, and, and that just, it grated on me because I've been I've raised uh, in a, in a family orientated environment mm -hmm. where, you know, family is key. And I just, you know, it just really struck on, on my heartstrings. And so I started putting content out on YouTube and Facebook and, Obviously, that's evolved to uh, to Instagram and LinkedIn over the years. Um, just saying, look, these are the reasons that businesses go bust. Um, it's all cash flow related. Yes, but there's there's it's reasons. Not a lack of profit. It's the lack of managing your yeah. cash. It's, it's nothing to do with profit. It's cash flow. Because let's just say uh, you and I could have a go and have a meeting with someone. <clears throat> I could go home tonight and say to my wife, "Babe, like we've just done a deal uh, for our biggest client. We're gonna it's gonna bring in a million pounds and a fifty percent net profit margin." Okay. So that's 500 grand net profit for us over the next 12 months. Brilliant. So ticks the box of profit, ticks the box of turnover for a million pounds. If that money doesn't come into our business account, for whatever reason, it's not re really real. It's not It's not in our control. Therefore, it is not, it's the cash flow that's the most And it might even be we have to deliver 500,000 pounds of work first. Yeah, of course. Before that money comes. Of course. And that will impact cash flow. So, well. so turnover and profit is great. Um, if anything, focus more on profit than turnover. Um, but cash flow, if it's not in the bank, it's not really real. You're not in control of it. It's just numbers, uh, you know, on a page or on a screen. And so um, that became more and more frustrating. And then that led me on to um, so pumping out loads of content about look, these are all the, the, the reasons behind the cash flow problems. If you did the opposite of that, you're going to have a strong foundation to build a successful business, whatever a successful business looks like to you. With There was no... There was no hidden agenda. There was no, uh, there's nothing to offer after that. I had no business off the back end of that, no services. And then uh, after a fair bit of, of abuse online, which is fine, because uh, it, it, it took a while for me to get my head around it. You know, why why are people reacting? Like, yeah, like, yeah. you know, the people that don't know me, they're, they're, they're having a pop at me for all kinds of different things and, and, you know, essentially just trying to put me down. Well, I just stayed focused. I thought, you know, there's someone behind that screen that might be watching this video today that needs to hear what I've got to say because they're at the end where potentially today might be the day that they yeah. end their life. And and so that, I just thought, that supersedes any negativity. It's crazy that we're in a world where people can feel that actually because of lack of money or the financial position they're in, that their their life is worth less yes. than the money yeah. or the financial problem that they might be in. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. That I, I like it's mind blowing to me. I there's 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 lots of different reasons why people get to a stage in life uh, where they feel there's no way out and and they they feel that there's a the better option is to to kill themselves. There's never a good reason to commit suicide in my head. The worst reason is about money, because there's a lack of constant evolving information about what a bailiff can and can't do yeah. if your family's there. Yeah. Um, what the worst case scenario is if you do go to court. You know what the the worst case scenario is if if your business does go into liquidation. I mean, just to give you some context, I mean, we touched on it. You know, uh, 55 businesses every single day in England and Wales, on average, over the last 30 years, go bust. 13 of those 55, 25% are trades, construction, property related businesses, which okay. means we're talking like, you know, hundreds of, of thousands um, over those years. Yeah, we're working at probably over 3,000 businesses a year. Exactly. Going bust that are in this space. Yeah, exactly. And so it happens so often, it's not it's not a big deal. And, and I don't mean to belittle um, liquidations and the, the trauma and the stress and everything that goes around it. But oftentimes when we're going through a problem, and in this case, uh, you know, a money problem, it's easy to feel like you're the only one going through it. Well, actually, there's millions of people that have gone through it yeah. over the last however many years, in, you know, all, all around the world because, you know, cash flow is universal, money problems are universal, they're not prejudiced. doesn't matter how big or small your business is. I've dealt with businesses that are doing 10, 11, 12 million in turnover, end up going bust. It's not about the more money you have, the less 
uh, the less the safer you are. Yeah, exactly. The, the more insulated you are, it doesn't make a difference. It's not prejudice. You can be tall, short, bald, you know, big business, small. It doesn't make a difference. Solvency and insolvency, numbers don't lie. And so um, pumping out content and then took loads of abuse. And then within three months of that, um, someone uh, reached out to me on Facebook, sent me a, a message on Facebook Messenger saying, look, I'm not in debt. Um, I've been watching your videos. I run a um, a high-end nanny service uh, business in Moscow. Born and raised in North London. Uh, was a, a high-end nanny herself for a wealthy family in Moscow. Then set up an agency um, offering uh, the same services to other wealthy families in Moscow, London, and Dubai. Uh, not in not in debt. Any money that, that the business owes is to me uh, as the director. I put money in. Um, last year was a great year in business. This year, it seems to be the opposite. And I don't know why. I'm at a crossroads. I'm not in debt. I'm at a crossroads. I feel like I want to end it because I've fallen out of love with it. My last shot is is you. I don't feel like there's anyone else I can turn to. I've been watching your videos. Uh, in particular, a video that you posted last Tuesday. I did what you said and, and I got a good result, but I need help. Um, what's the next step? Can you help me? And I actually had nothing to offer. And so she suggested, not a trade or construction business, you know, not a male because most of our clients are, um, are male. Just said, look, what if I paid you... This is back in 2015. What if I paid you 200 pounds a month? We jump on on um, Skype and then um, for an hour. I'll just ask you questions about the business. You tell me what you think I should do, and then we'll go from there. Yes. So we did that, um, and within three months, she made 16,100 pound more in those three months than she did in the previous uh, 12 months. Um, she was happy. She gave me a testimonial. Um, I put it on Facebook. That attracted three more clients followed the same process. They then got results, got more testimonials. And it's just slowly been building from there. I've been pumping out content every day for the last nine years. Right. People saw it, invited me to speak at various events, small events at the time, excuse me, um, up and down the country. That started to build up a little bit of a following. Um, and then, you know, fast forward now, we've got um, we've got clients all around the UK, um, all the way up to Cumbria. Not any nannies any, anymore? No, no nannies. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've narrowed down to a core business yeah. type. Yeah, and the reason it, it kind of happened partly on purpose, partly by accident. When I worked in the insolvency industry, like I said, 25% of all businesses that go bust in England and Wales are trades, construction, property-related businesses. So naturally, by default, in the insolvency industry, I just spent more time with that industry or those industries. And so I just found it easier to relate to. It's technically speaking, it's the most suffering industry out of all the industries out there. Um, that needed the help the most, if you want to put it that way. Um, and it's just evolved in that way. So we've got trades and construction business owners all around the UK, all the way up to Cumbria, down to Newquay, Bristol, Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, and now uh, Belfast, Cardiff, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, that all come to our training centre once a month um, in North London, uh, which is amazing because there's a there's a team behind every uh, trades and construction business owner. There's a family behind and uh, behind that business. And, and so, you know, we, we help these guys... Um, essentially, you know, and this this feeds back into how do we know a good trades business from from not? Um, and so, a lot of the things that these guys come to us uh, and say, the three typical statements are: we have a up and down cash flow, good month, bad month, good month, bad month. Because if there's a trades and construction business owner that, that's having a good month, then bad month, there's a good chance that they're going to be distracted on your job, yeah, because they're worried about cash flow problems, or they want to try and maybe leave site on your job go and bang out a couple of small jobs yeah get some cash flow in so so um you know we help them with, with that so consistent cash flow um also uh, a lot of the guys will say to us we get to the end of a project and there's little or no profit we're like where's the profit gone or they'll get a call from the accountant saying oh well done we've drafted your accounts you've had a better year this year than last year this much turnover and this much profit well done and they turn around and say to the the accountant well where where the hell is it because it's not in my account um, or the idea, but here's your tax bill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the money's not there. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, or they say, look, I'm a, I'm a great carpenter, I'm a brilliant builder, I'm a fantastic electrician, but no one's ever shown me how to run a business. Mm. So we do all of that so that it gives confidence in the marketplace, confidence to to the, the client, the consumer, um, that they know that they're dealing with someone that can structure, organize, manage their business well enough that they can focus on the job at hand. Yeah. You know? it's, a really, it's a really good point you make there about Someone could be a fantastic tradesperson, skilled at their craft, a carpenter, plumber, electrician, whatever it might be, 
but they haven't really learned the art of business. Yeah. They've learned their skill. They've probably worked under somebody else and thinking, well, I could probably do a better job doing this myself or earn more money. And they're off doing that. But now they have to be a bookkeeper. They have to do customer service, uh, you know, they do all these other things. Um, and th they don't under, they don't understand them. And like I said, with regards to going out doing the uh, quotes, for example, if you're spending your evenings doing five, six quotes and, you know, you know, all of those aren't going to come through. And there is a degree of, well, actually, am I wasting my time doing this? Do I bother? Which what I said earlier about you don't get quotes back because the the tradesperson may not feel actually this is of value to them as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. The the I'm gonna say the typical scenario, um, a common scenario okay. is that um, I'm just going from experience and conversations that we've had with thousands of tradespeople over the last 17 years. The common um, journey is that. A lot of the guys are not academic. They go through school. Different conversation. Obviously, the education system is not set up for where we are in the society now. It was, you know, it, 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 a different time is when it was set up. And so a lot of us, and me included, not academic at school, you go through the motions, you get to the end. If you haven't been expelled, you get to the end. And um, a lot of people think, yeah, I'm going to go off to college. I'm going to go and do this, go and do that. And, and you don't want to do that um, or you can't get in, whatever the situation is. And then you say to your mom and dad, I'm going to take some time off. They say, no, you ain't. You're going to go and work with your uncle or your brother or your dad or whatever on site. And you're going to learn a trade. So then they go and learn a trade. They could be a, a bricklayer, a carpenter, electrician. You start to, you know, learn for at, at apprentice level or, or just, a, you know, a dog's body on site. Um, then you, you pick up the craft, you, you know, you gain experience, you gain some qualifications, you know, along that journey. Then you think, actually, I can do this on my own. Um, and you might be a subcontractor to, a, you know, various companies for a bit, or you might think, you know what, actually, I'll do this properly by myself, you know, go and get a logo done, mm -hmm. set up a bank account, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then now all of a sudden you find yourself in a position where you've got to market the business, mm -hmm. you've got to go and do quote visits, so you've got to be a salesperson as well. You've got to run the jobs, which is the thing that you can do and you've been trained on, but then you've got to be, like you say, a bookkeeper, a marketeer, a salesperson, you know, all of these things, an entrepreneur, um, and then you get to a place where, you know, you get some credit given to you and you get some money in and, you know, before you know it, you're tendering for bigger jobs and there's more money coming in and the numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the chaos is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger um, until the point where you're like, shit, I don't, I don't really know, A, how did I get here and yeah. B, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and again, like you look at um, a common, I'm going to say most people or, or typical, but a common, um, a common day for a trade and construction business owner, even with a team, is that you're up really early, you're sending out invoices, dealing with emails, you know, and, and out the door at like 7 a.m., maybe even earlier, pop into the suppliers, you know, going on site, getting the team set up. Then you're on the tools all day. You know, you're, you've got, you know, people asking you questions all the time, whether it's customers and, uh, you know, the team and suppliers and all this stuff going on. Um, back in your mind, you're thinking, shit, I've got a couple of quote visits to do after work. Then I've got five quotes to do and send out i'm going to be home late again my wife's going to be pissed off at me i'm going to miss bedtime and bath time with the kids um and then you know you're in the doghouse you're eating dinner by yourself then you're on the laptop you know until 10 11 12 at night doing all the quotations then you're up early again and it's groundhog day doing the same thing you know at what point do you think there's more to life than this yeah. um and so you know what kind of impression does that live get that that leave for us as the, the consumers. Yeah. And so um, to answer a question that you asked a few moments ago, what do we do now and how has it evolved to? We've evolved into a um, a national training, business training center for, for trades and construction um, based in North London. Uh, we've got a nice space, 2,700 square foot there. Um, and, and essentially we run um, one day trainings, we run uh, mastermind groups, training days, one-to-one -one consultancy. Um, for different levels of businesses, all the way from startups, all the way up to twenty million pounds uh, in turnover uh, per year, um, and and those are the, the essentially the services that we offer. But um, it's helping the trades become better at what they do in terms of running the business side yeah. of things. You're not helping them be a better carpenter or better electrician. Yeah. You're helping them run their businesses mm. better and understand cash flow, which is obviously key. And yep. uh, uh, the thing that, as you mentioned earlier, that needs to many businesses fail is that lack of cash flow or poor cash flow management. Yeah. So on the flip side of what we're talking about right now is sometimes you'll see a, a tradesperson, a business, a contractor that is phenomenal at marketing. They look amazing. Their branding, everything, presentation is just brilliant. 
how is it that we can see past some of that to see actually are they any good as well? Yeah, or great they're just question. brilliant marketeers. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, another thing that that you can do as a consumer and then to time with answering this question is um, ask to see examples of their work. Mm. Um, another thing you can do is ask to speak to previous clients and or if it's geographically yes. uh, viable, go and see some of their work, like physically see it, <laughs> and then ask the the former clients. What was the experience like? Yeah. You know, what, what was your intentions going into the project versus the outcome? Are the two aligned? You know? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and yeah, of course, arguably, if you're going to have a conversation with the next client of a tradesperson, then you'd like to think that the tradesperson is going to put you in front of one of their good clients, yeah. not someone's yeah. going to have some. But, but at the same time, you can have, you know, some of those conversations um, around doing that. So, yeah, you could like do your due diligence on the finance of the business. But again, let's be honest whatever's uh, reflected in accounts uh, for a limited company, you can you can tweak yeah. what you reflect to suit whatever you need to do in business or life, whether it's get a mortgage or, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't, it's not a true reflection mm -hmm. of where a business is just because you can go on companies out and, and yeah. see the last accounts. Um, but I would definitely look beyond just the marketing because like you say, um, you know, the people that are just great marketers or great salespeople, or as, you're, as we all grow our teams in business, you get someone that, that just interviews really, really well, but then on the job, they're not what they said they were at the interview. So, yeah, I'll definitely look past that, look at reviews, look at um, previous work, speak to former clients, go and see some of the work if possible, especially if it's um, a big refurb, you know, where someone was in someone's home for a month, two months, three months, nine months, you know. Excuse me, I'll definitely... Um, yeah, I'll go the I like that. One of the things I say to my students is go and visit live projects that they're doing. Yeah particularly if the larger renovations and stuff. Because even if you don't know anything about renovating, you get a sense for how are they running that site, how clean and organized it is, how is the communication, um, you know, just what what's the general feeling you get about the site and the environment. Yeah. And that impression can give an indication of what you might experience with them, yeah. even if you know nothing about construction. Yeah, yeah exactly. The other thing I'd ask uh, as a, uh, a consumer, um, based on what you just said there, is actually ask the, the, the tradesper, the builder, whoever you're, you're dealing with, um, what they're like on site with other trades as well. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize this because I've, I've never been on site in that capacity myself and I'm not a trades person. Um, but I didn't realize the stuff that goes on on site and 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 let's just say the bickering yeah. that happens between <laughs> trades and, and the jokes that they're saying. Yeah. If you're an electrician and you're watching this, yeah. um, they say, you know, electricians don't know how to use a broom. They never yeah. tie them off themselves, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Or there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a perceived food chain yeah. of what trades are above yeah, what trade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we had it on when we had did almost a four e for uh, six years ago. Like I mentioned, I happened to pop in to have a look, a look one day, and there was just a, a tension and negative right. energy. Oh, what the hell going on? The decorators were absolutely fuming that the plumber had turned the water off, and they were looking forward to having a cup of tea. <laughs> and they couldn't put the kettle on. Yeah. And they almost came to blows before I got wow. there. Wow. You know, so like all this kind of stuff goes on, you know. But and sometimes it can be other tensions and that's just the thing. That's the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Camel's back. Yeah. It's a little thing, but there's actually a lot of other stuff going on as well. Exactly right. So just to um, delve deeper, a couple of layers on that. If you've got a trade that's come in and they've come in under the proviso that the property is at a certain stage ready for them to come in and do their bit. Mm -hmm. And then they get on, on, on site and it's not, ready not ready for them and they can't do their bit so they they've allocated that day or time that week to go and do their bit and now they can't do it a they've got to rejuggle their their weekly schedule maybe try and move some jobs around if they can't do that they can't do the job that they thought they were going to finish which means they can't invoice until they finish which means they can't get paid and then get the cash flow so now that adds to the pressure because again going back to if we make the assumption that there is obviously a certain amount of of not just trades, but in this case, trades businesses that do have cash flow issues occasionally. And they get on site knowing full well, like their lifeline this week yes. is, right, brilliant, looking at the diary, we're going to finish that job, we can invoice, we can get paid straight away, we can move on, we, we need that money for payroll, we need that money for yeah. the supplies. And they get on site and that trade um, is outside having a cup of tea or a cigarette or whatever and hasn't finished their bit for this trade to come in yeah. and do that. What's going to happen? Yeah. It's not going to be a nice, pleasant conversation, is it? So, you know, that's why I think it's important as a consumer to ask, um, ask how how you communicate and, yeah. and and what you're like on site, and give us some examples of that. And yes, 
it's amazing some of the uh, experience that we've had with traders over the years where we really got to realize how important cash flow is for them. When somebody wants paid on a certain day, at a certain time, um, because they rely on that to get other things done. And you're thinking, yeah, we'll get it paid on Friday or whatever. Right, it's, matter, it's rolled over to Monday. It's not a problem. Yeah. It might not be a problem for you, but it could be a major problem for them. 100%. Because we haven't thought about the impact they might have and what they need to do on uh, yeah. that payment. So so I just gave the example of a, a supplier invoice in need paying, paying um, a supplier invoice being paying, sorry. Um, but what about a scenario where they the the tradesperson's bought in a subcontractor, and that subcontractor has come in um, on a day rate to go and do that job? The the property is not at that stage yet, yeah. so they can't do that. He needs paying because he's blocked out his diary. He can't get any more work for that day. He needs paying. Yeah. More. I mean, we we had a site. We were building some houses. We had a contractor that was doing that job, and they went bust during a uh, during COVID, um, and then unfortunately what happened some of the trades came to start ripping out some of the stuff they'd they put in now we'd paid everything we'd had to pay up to that point because we were monitoring yeah. surveyors for the for the uh, for the Re project retention of title but i could understand um the frustration they were feeling so for example pulling sockets off the wall they're of no real value it probably cost them more time to take them off the wall yeah but you could see how how hurt they were what they've experienced and really, it was a contractor that was taking advantage of everybody in, in the sense that they were being given the work, they were paid, they were mismanaging the money, but then not paying the, the trades. Yeah. And the trades often, when we talk about that food chain, they're at the bottom. They're the ones working on a, a, a day rate almost. Yeah, exactly right. So another thing based on that that actual example that, that we can do when dealing with um, with builders or other trades is um, is also ensure that you're dealing with someone that takes card payments. And then pay at least a hundred pounds of it, if not all of it, um, on a credit card, because then you get an automatic insurance which supersedes insolvency if that trades and construction business owner, that builder, etc., goes bust. Yeah. Um, so you can claim that money back. And funny enough, actually, uh, knowing what I know about the industry, and you know, we, we do this and we live by these rules. And um, again, the the almost full refurb that we did six years ago, it included a new kitchen. Mm -hmm. The the kitchen company went bust. Right. Um, in a very, very um, snaky way. Okay. Uh, and look, I, I, as much as I, I take pride in being calm and methodical, there was a part of me that, that wanted to um, unleash the the nastier side of me. But, but you know, we, we, we I've paid... I've never seen you being calm. I've yeah. never seen you yeah, yeah. being calm. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm glad because that's, yeah. the, that's the side that I want you to see. <laughs> but um, look, luckily we paid um, half of it on a credit card, in which case we, we got our money back. But, uh, so just... Just elaborate on that point because that's a key point that many people may not understand. Yeah. The impact and the power of paying some of it on a credit card, mm. what that means. Yeah, so um, one of the benefits, uh, there are many, one of the benefits of using credit cards, um, definitely not to get into debt, but one of the benefits is that you get automatic insurance mm. uh, with a credit card versus a debit card. And so either you pay the full amount or half of it on a credit card, but the very least you need to pay £100 minimum. It could be a a twenty thousand pound transaction of which a hundred pounds of it is on a credit card, and then you bank transfer the other nineteen thousand uh, nine hundred, but you're covered for the entire twenty thousand because of the hundred pound yes. contribution on a credit card, which is absolutely critical. It's a must for me, you know, in this day and age because it supersedes insolvency. Mm -hmm. So if a, a business does unfortunately go bust, that's no, fine. If the especially if there's no money in the in the liquidation, there's no assets to sell to sell to pay off creditors, then you're going to get all your money back. Yeah. And a lot quicker than insolvency anyway. Yeah. And in this climate that we're in now, this recessionary, what feels like a recessionary environment and people are tightening the purse strings and, you know, tightening the belts um, and we're unsure how long it's going to go on for and the impact it's going to have. When we are uh, instructing uh, tradespeople, contractors for jobs that we're doing, what suggestion do you have in terms of how much should be paid when? And because there's always this, oh, they want this much up front or they want half it paid or they want it split over 10 weeks as equal payments. What's your thoughts and views on, on yeah. payments to contractors and builders? Yeah, I think um, I, I really like this question because I think to myself, I, you know, generally you want to get the best deal um, and you want to part with the least amount of money um, less frequently. I get all of that. I remember when I bought my um, my dream car last year and uh, it, it's just naturally... It's a beautiful car, so I might as well share what it is. Thank you. It's a Porsche 911. Um, so I, I, I found the car one year. I've been looking for it for a year. Um, and it's in me, 
in these scenarios, especially dealing with the cars, to negotiate. So I, I started the negotiation process and uh, dropped it a thousand pounds or whatever, and, and I thought, you know, I'm going to I'm going to keep going, keep going. Then I just I stopped myself and I thought I want to look back on this experience as the first time I bought a car like this. I've wanted this car for 35 years. Um, I want to look back at the experience as it being a pleasant experience. When I go and pick up the keys, pick up the car, I want to I want to hug the guy. I want to I want it to be a, a enjoy. I, you know, I took him a present. Them as well. Yeah, you know, and I want it to be a great experience for them and for me. I don't want to have like you know a negative energy. And so if we if we take that example and and put it into into a, a, a trade uh, and construction project, is do you want someone working on your property, which is a big asset? Do you want someone being pissed off at you, which may or may not, but let's be honest, probably will affect the quality of the work and the experience, or do you want a nice, pleasant? happy experience for all parties yeah. in which case yes you might want to negotiate a little bit um you know that that's that's separate but in terms of how people charge if you find found the right person you're like you know what i get a good a good feeling about th these guys this builder and the builder says yeah it's i don't know 25 percent deposit or 50 percent deposit 25 percent deposit and then phase payments you know for every phase of the project for the next 10 weeks or three months or or whatever it is, then you know you're essentially paying phase by phase. Then go with it, um, because ultimately I want I want this experience to be great, yeah. and I don't want them to be pissed off or angry or prioritize other jobs um, over and above mine. So, how can we find a middle ground that they're happy with, I'm happy with, everyone wins, um, and then it's a great experience and a great result. Because I'm, I'm a firm believer of what I mentioned earlier about people only care about the result and the experience that they're left with. And so, you know, it's different if it's going to be a short term service and you're never going to see someone again. OK, fine. Like you don't really care about what the outcome is in long term relationships. But in this kind of situation where you might have a problem six months down the line, you want to feel comfortable yes. to be able to pick up the phone and say, look, this has happened. What do we do um, if it's something that they need to come and do? You know, it's a it's a nice, pleasant, yeah. friendly conversation. Like, yeah, no problem. We'll be around tomorrow or next week, or, you know, whatever the situation is. So, you know, it's about relationships. And, yeah. and I feel like, yes, it's in my nature to negotiate. Um, I think it's probably from the part of the world that I'm from or that region. Um, but at the same time, you know, we went to um, to Marrakesh a few years ago. It Culturally, yeah. it's not acceptable. Culturally, it's expected. Yeah. So then you know, there's elements of that. But also in parts of, you know, a business and, and life, it's not expected and actually it's frowned upon it that people don't like it yeah. and so you know be clear on what your ideal outcome is if you're looking to just piss people off and get the best deal and squeeze as much out of a deal and save as much money or make as much money and you want you don't care about what people think of you then fine knock yourself because out on that point if you do that within this context of property and you're employing a, a tradesperson for example unless you really understand those skills and if you squeeze somebody so much that they feel resentment in taking this project on do you think there's an opportunity for them to cut a lot of corners? Absolutely there is. You're not going to get what you thought you were going to get yeah. because they don't feel good about doing the work. And when you do have a problem in six months' time, they're not going to take your call. Why would they? Why should they? Yeah. Yeah. So if there's if there's profit in them, they were happy, they delivered the uh, job while you're happy in terms of what you've got and it'll continue into a, a longer-term relationship. Yeah, so so I, I would, yeah, exactly right. So I would look to have a long-term relationship Go with, you know, unless it's there's a specific reason why it just doesn't mm. sit right with you to make those face payments. Um, but then also, you know, find and deal with with builders in this example that do take hard payments and that you can get that automatic insurance and at least that covers you and you feel comfortable going into it. That, you know, absolute worst case scenario. Of course, it will be a nightmare if this builder does go bust because we've got to start the project again and find another builder. And, and naturally, there's a lot of people that are reluctant to pick up from someone else's work. Yeah. So there's that element to it as well. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, the worst case would be that a builder goes bust and you lose your money. At least you get your money back and yeah, you start again. But yeah, I, I would do that and just just um, you know just look at it from what's the best case scenario for you? What's the best case scenario for them? Uh, and find a nice happy medium, a uh, middle ground and, and move forward with it. Yeah. What are some of the underhand tactics that happen within the building trade and the contractor trade as a consumer that we should be maybe mindful of and, and to maybe look out for and try and protect ourselves? Yeah, interesting question. Um, and again, the caveat here is that I'm not a trade construction business owner. And so, um, and again, I'm very grateful that a lot of our guys are highly ethical and, and you know, they live their lives with integrity and yeah. 
you know, and, and that kind of thing and build long-term relationships. And so I feel that um, if if you, you get a, a bad, I don't know about any specific things, um, you hear you hear about nightmare stories like, you know, um, not the right RSJs or beams mm. being put in and uh, and building control coming and saying, this is, this I can't pass this. Mm. Um, so, you know, that kind of stuff. But I, I don't know how you would, you would know unless you've got um, a project manager on site in kind of like following the build process, you know, step by step. But just what kind of feeling do you get? Uh, I'd go back to um, the examples we gave before, you know, look at the reviews, yeah. um, ask for pictures um, of before and after of previous projects, speak to former clients, go and see some of the work and ask questions um, because then now you can start to uh, get a real uh, feel for the, for the type of builder and company that you're dealing with. Um, and also just the way that they come across, you know, I, I, I don't actually know any, any specific things about, you know, um, what could someone do, you know, from a, from an actual trade point of view, um, because it's not my expertise and I try and stay in my own lane. Yeah. But it's that thing uh, you said about how, how do you feel about that person? You know, yeah. use some, some human instinct, some gut feeling. Yeah. And if it feels right, the connection, the relationship feels actually, this is somebody I can work with. Ultimately, we do business with people we know, like, and trust. And are you getting that feeling about that person? Yeah. And if you're not, it doesn't matter how brilliant your paperwork is, that's not going to protect you if things go yeah. wrong. Yeah. So you, you need to be comfortable right at the beginning, actually, this is somebody I can work with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, it's, it's like that with all walks of life. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, we, we both uh, run our own businesses and, and have a growing team. And, you know, if you you want to squeeze the most out of every member of your team, um, and whenever they need something from you, maybe a little bit over and above the normal working relationship, you know, some time off, um, maybe something's happened in their family and they could do with being paid early or some of the, you know, this month's payroll. You know, you want to be in a situation. I, I actually um, I actually look for opportunities. Every single person that we know, right here, right now, if you were to list your loved ones and your friends and family, people you care about the most, your team, Every single one of those people that you're thinking of right now is going through something right now in life. And so any opportunity that you've got to help them, uh, I will jump at it. You know, uh, we recently had one of our team just say, look, something's happened uh, at home. I'm okay. There's no major issues. How could I possibly get paid this month's wages a week early uh, rather than next week? My question is, my, my response story is absolutely no problem. Is everything okay? Yep. Yeah. Cool. No problem. It's done. Because I'm I'm looking for opportunities to to create relationships where if and when I ever need something, I don't want to automatically expect them to do it, but I've created an environment where they're more likely to do it. And so I would do the same with builders and other trades and uh, and people that you're dealing with as you're building your property portfolio in in this case. Um, and just you know you're dealing with humans. And I know there's all this conversation about artificial intelligence, and that's fine, but it's still controlled by human beings, you know, with emotions, with people who are going through stuff. So, you know, if a trace person feels like you're trying to absolutely drain everything out of them, are they more likely or less likely to want to help you on your project or beyond that? Yes. Can I? Not only that, they, if you maintain good relationships like that, they will know other great people as well. If they're good and ethical in their practice and behavior, it's very likely they work with other people that are the same. And when you've got a good carpenter and you need an electrician, they should be your port of contact. Who do you suggest? Who do you suggest I speak to? Because it's very likely they'll recommend somebody that will be similar to them. Exactly. And and even, again, you know, as you're building a property portfolio, if you've got a certain source of property, wherever it, wherever it might come from, and the first time you have dealings with that source for that particular property, it wasn't a pleasant experience and, you you know, you were rude and you were trying to get as much out of the deal as possible with with no intention for a long-term relationship, the next time you go to that source for the next potential property deal, are they going to want to do business with you or go and do business with someone else? So, you know, it's just, it's just actually a a, a rule for life, in my opinion, not just necessarily for property or... Yeah, it just reminded me that there's probably quite a few deals we've done which have been introduced to us from other tradespeople that we work with. Yep. And, uh, you know, and we're forever grateful for that. And I think about that's because we invest in the relationships. And I I always enjoy having conversation with you because you're always thinking about what's in it for the other person. How can I serve and help the other person? Yeah, it's just um, it, it. It's something that I stumbled on a few years ago, and I thought it's, it served me so bloody well. And I, and I just I, I share it as often as anyone's interested in listening, because I just feel like in a world where it 
oftentimes people are focused on what they're going to get out of the deal or the conversation or the yeah, yeah. Or what's in, in it for me mentality i just feel like there's certain things that we become numb to because we hear them as phrases often uh there's a great um a great uh statement from um stephen bartlett uh diary of a ceo podcast many people will say i don't know statistically if this is right but many people say it is the the biggest best most successful podcast in europe whether it is or, or it isn't what typically happens in uh, some, if not many, podcasts that say, oh, you know, um, please like and subscribe, which is fine. But when you hear that once, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, your your mind becomes, yeah, numb to it. It just doesn't, you've heard it before. His thing is, he says, I hope nobody's listening. If you are, keep it to yourself. Yeah, amazing. So he just yeah. trips that, yeah. what you expect to hear. And so, again, going back to the point, when a lot of people... Or some people, you know, are in it for, you know, what's in it for me kind of approach. And you approach things in the opposite way, which is that forget talking about me at this point. What's your ideal outcome? Mm. What's the, what, what, if this was a great conversation, a great transaction, a great property deal, what, what would that look like for you? Yes. And if I can help achieve that, you're more likely to help me achieve my goal. Yes. Um, and so that approach has, has worked so well for me, if I'm being completely honest and transparent in terms of, um, you know, uh, speaking on various stages and being invited to speak on podcasts and doing deals with people and referrals and, and just having a, a just a better outcome. Because uh, actually, I, I feel like by you getting something out of a relationship, a conversation, a deal, a transaction, a property deal, the benefit to you is short term. The benefit to you in focusing on the other person first actually means that the benefit to you is long term mm. because you look back on that and say, I actually did good. Yes. I did good for someone else. I did good in the world. I put some good energy out there. And I, and I believe that, that that stuff comes back. Yes. Rather than just short term, what can I get out of it? You know, I don't, I don't feel like that that serves you moving forward as a, as a long term strategy. Short term, fine. But if you're only concerned with short term, yeah. what happens after that? Yeah. We were talking earlier about running a program at the moment, helping people get deals done in relatively short space of time. And the whole ethos of that is get in front of the owner, sit down with them and understand what do they want. What would a great deal look like for them? How can we make that work? Then see if there's an opportunity rather than going with the mindset, I'm just going to drive this price right down. Yeah. I just, uh, like, I just, I, I love this line of thinking. Um, and that's why I, I love surrounding myself with great people like you and, and some of the people that we've got in common. But I often, like, I, I ask my wife certain questions. And people say to me, not very often, but let's just say in some conversations, you know, someone says, like, do you think you're a great husband? It's irrelevant if I say yes or no. The only person on this planet that could genuinely answer that question yeah. is my wife. Yeah. So why wouldn't I ask her, am I a good husband? On a scale of one to ten, like, you know, am I a good employer? Well, I might think I am, but it's irrelevant what I think. I've got to ask my, my employees. And so... You know, that, that thought process has, has served me really well. And I think it's a great starting point for anything because it just, I think it starts off the conversation really, really well. We use it in our sales process and our marketing. It's all about adding value up front to the other person first and then seeing where it goes because actually I'm gaining something from that anyway. Yeah. You know, I grow as a person. I feel like I'm, I'm helping someone else. Um, whenever I'm having a bad day, you know, we all have bad days in life and business. All it takes for me, the older I get, um, the more self-aware I am. All it takes for me is just to be reminded of if I focus on other people or at least one person today and help one person today, my problems and my shit day feel yeah. uh, uh, insignificant. Yeah. George, I always enjoy spending time here and I really uh, enjoyed this today. What's the best way for people to reach out to you and connect to you and which type of person is the best type of person you can help and serve as well? Yeah, great question. So uh, we probably work with trades and construction business owners, um, but we're in the process of attracting more female tradespeople. And we've actually, we've been asked for, for a good couple of years now um, from non-trades and construction business owners if we can help them. So we've, excuse me, we now offer a one day cash flow on tap workshop for non-trades um, as well. So any any business. Best way to get in touch with us is um, on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram handle is george.cashflow. Um, and on there, um, you go into the bio, there's a, a nice guide that you can download called Master Your Cash Flow. And within that guide, 
Um, there is the 13 numbers that you need to know in business. Um, so know your numbers to be able to grow your numbers and also um, 10 ways that you can improve your cash flow right now immediately. So, um, you know, if, if you found any of this useful, then by all means, go and grab that, that free guide. George, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Thank you.